Hey everyone, welcome to today's live stream. It's so fun to be able to live stream again. It was a while since I took a bit of a break during the, the December month and all the holidays, but now I am back in full force. Just need to check the sound here. Uh, and well, I'm back in full force and today's topic is something that is very dear to my heart, namely sewing activewear, which is uh, something I've also written a book about. And uh, well, the book is this one. It looks like this. And it still feels a little bit surreal that I've actually been able to, to pull this product off. I, I began in 2016 and it was published in December of 2017, so that gives you a bit of an idea of how long it actually took me. Also, one of the reasons was obviously that I, I did this as a side project. I work full time and this was something I did in, in the mornings, uh, evenings and weekends. Um, and also I did pretty much everything myself as well, doing both the photography, the writing, the design of the book uh, was all my my hand scene so it was definitely a, very much a DIY project and if anyone who is in the chat now uh, and watching has the book I would love to know just please tell me in the chat and also what you think about the book I would love to know uh, hopefully you will like it but if you don't just please tell me it's always good to get some feedback on the book uh, so so a lot of the things I will talk about tonight is in also covered in the book but I think that it's really good when I can also show you stuff so a lot of things now tonight I will be able to show in real life what I'm talking about and also answer your questions so please chime in if you want to know anything and of course let's keep the discussion going in the chat because we can all learn from each other so that's super helpful so please chime in about all that and um, I'm seeing there's some people now in the chat hi Kathleen and uh, Empress Noel love your name there Christopher hello Saturday Night Stitch, hi. And Marie, hello Marie. And uh, so nice to hear you and just keep the chat going. And uh, well, let's start with topic number one. I have a long list of topics tonight, so we'll see how much I will be able to cover. I will go for about an hour like I usually do. And also we have more chat here, people. Um, Re Humble Raven, greetings all, Iron, hello, and Greg, hello from Florida, USA, it's nice always, always to have an international audience, so nice to hear from your guys, I love that you, you say hi in the chat, that makes me super happy to hear, hello Eleanor, hi, hi, uh, so, now let's talk about topic number one, and that is fabrics, and obviously, with every sewing product, fabrics is a key component when it comes to a successful make so that is why it's really important to be mindful when you're picking the proper fabric for each activewear product so I'm gonna start with the type of fabric that I think a lot of you use a lot when it comes to active and that is stretchy liquor stretchy spandex fabrics knit fabrics because those are the ones that I think a lot of people will start with and want to know more more about Also, I'm just going to post a link in the, the description section as well, if you can't see here. Um, and if you have some problems watching, you can click on the link in the, the comment section there. So nice. Okay, now let's talk about fabrics. And when you're starting out, and you the key thing, obviously, when you want to do work with stretch and knit is to find knit fabrics that have wicking properties and that can be really difficult because it isn't always clearly labeled and and some synthetic fabrics will wick away moisture better than the other type of fabric so one of the first thing you should look for is brand names and there are a couple of brand names that have wicking properties one of those is suplex and the one i'm holding up here for you looks like this this is suplex and this is a wonderful fabric to work with when you're 
making your own active wear it's it's really soft and it doesn't feel like a natural fiber but it feels really close to a natural fiber if that makes sense so it's it has almost like a cotton feeling and this i think if you're going to use supplex i would highly recommend that you use it for any type of um, top if you want to have some kind of shape for instance if you want to make like a more form-fitting um, t-shirt supplex is a wonderful fabric or a tank top and also if the supplex is firm enough it will also be really good for leggings and one of the things you always need to consider when you're picking the right fabric is how firm and how supple it is because sometimes a fabric can um, have like perhaps the proper thickness but it it isn't really suitable for the particular product for instance um Another really great wick away fabric uh, is called Merrill. And again, it's really soft to the skin. But when, it, when I'm stretching this out, as you can see, it's quite transparent. So the thing here is that this is a perfect fabric for like a loose fitting t-shirt, perhaps a tighter fitting t-shirt as well. But you should be mindful that it might, you know, show some of the bulges and, and be a, a little bit transparent. So for those reasons, this kind of fabric is much better suited for a top or a tank top than a pair of leggings. Uh, whereas, if you want to make a pair of leggings, you would definitely need to go for a more firmer, firmer knit fabric. For instance, this is the one that I ordered from Spoonflower that I, I made custom design. And this is almost like a compression fabric, so it's quite stable and it really hugs the body in a, in a nice way. So. That is one of the reasons that you also, you need to consider these things when you're picking the right fabric. Is it soft and supple? Well, maybe it's better for like a top or a t-shirt. And if it's a bit more firm, that means it's probably better for perhaps a pair of leggings or a bra or anything, you know, that needs a bit more support. Obviously it depends again on the style, but I'm, I'm talking primarily here about tight fitting, tight fitting clothes. So, uh, if you have any preferences, please tell me in the chat what, what sort of fabrics you like. And, and also another thing you need to consider perhaps is, is the weight of the fabric. So if some fabric vendors uh, specify how much, how much the fabric weigh uh, per square meter or per square feet, I think it says feet, right? It's not square foot. Uh, you can correct me in the chat. <laughs> this is always the same thing when I'm trying to speak English. I always make some errors. but usually you can see the weights and so that will give you an indication if it's a more heavy fabric or a bit of a lighter fabric so those things should really make um, a, a very formative decision and I, I make this mistake myself for instance i'm going to show you here one of the fairly recent mistakes i did when it came to picking the proper fabric for um, for my product and another spoon flower custom print fabric that i would um, i made this pair of leggings and uh, the spoon flower uh, sports liquor it's called it's it's really great for leggings because it can oh it's really firm and it shapes the bum nicely however i also did uh, a top from Boda styles january 2017 issue using uh, the same fabric now i love the design on the top it's really nice but the thing is that this fabric is so you know firm so it's like it's not really comfortable to wear it almost feels like a corset so we kind of squeeze the stomach and i know that some people like you know compression t-shirts and stuff i know that you can buy some ready to wear but at least for me i want my um my workout tops you know to gently hug the body not like you know squeeze them in so this is one of the things that i think you need really need to be mindful about when it comes to picking the right fabric so if you aren't sure, I would definitely, and you're ordering online, I would definitely recommend that you order samples because sometimes also it isn't actually correct in the, the description. For instance, I've ordered samples for something that has been labeled as a compression fabric, but in fact it was quite soft and didn't have compression properties. And also, even when it's sometimes labeled wicking, it isn't. So I had one of those instances I bought from uh, an American uh, vendor that's really good and I bought m great fabrics from them before. And, and this particular fabric was labeled as a wicking fabric. So I bought it in two colors, a lot of meters because uh, it was also made of recycled polyester. So I was really drawn by the more um, I, environmental friendliness of it as well. And anyways, 
it turned out that it was like exercising in a black plastic bag so it's like every, all the moisture was like kept inside and I didn't discover that because I batched made uh, four tops and one pair of leggings using this fabric so and uh, yeah it was pretty much impossible to use I can use this fabric if I'm doing you know a bit of a weightlifting because I don't sweat much but as soon as I sweat it's like yeah it's it feels like I, I contain lighters of water between my body and the garment and that was labeled a wick away fabric from a vendor that sells functional fabric so it, yes it is tricky <laughs> and um, yeah those are the things you really need to consider uh, when it comes to picking you know the right fabric when it comes to to liquor fabric and another thing is to think about how much spandex or liquor do you want in it and again it depends on several different factors I know when when it comes to swimsuit fabrics for instance I think you usually the range of spandex is around 20% I think it can be up to 20% whereas some of the fabrics that I've shown you here is around 5 to 10% so I don't think there's like an exact rule of thumb about uh, how much spandex and also one of the drawback I find personally that if it has too much spandex in it, it kind of alter the touch of the the fabric it makes it a little bit stiffer and a little bit plastic do you agree with me about that it's not really as as nice to the body and so that those are the things that I personally find that you also might need to consider but around I would say five to twenty percent is a good range of, of liquor or spandex or elastine so many names but it's basically the same kind of fiber I would probably mix this interchangeable obviously because uh, it's uh, in Sweden we say lycra and I know that in the States it's called spandex right and I also heard elastine uh, and I'm not quite sure where in the, the regions these different um, names are used for the same kind of material anyways that was about picking the right you know uh, knit fabric and and the liquor fabric uh, when you're doing sewing active wear and another thing that is quite common to work with is various kind of mesh fabric so I have here a big batch of fabrics it looks like <laughs> a mess basically the whole table here is filled about fabrics because I I wanted to talk about so many things so now I will talk about three common mesh fabrics that I think is very useful when it comes to sewing activewear and the first one is this and this is I think a lot of us recognize as a very classic mesh it's usually called sports mesh it can also be called airtics and this is the kind of mesh that for instance you might use in one of these um, oversized like baseball tank tops and it's usually not as stretchy as some of the other mesh it, as you can see it has some crosswise stretch and but lengthwise not much stretch at all so and it doesn't really retain its shape as well as some of the other mesh I'm going to show you so this I think is a great fabric to use for ventilations as from the sides I'm going to show you here uh, I did late last year I did this uh, top it's uh, fear trades uh, surf to summit and as you can see here I used mesh for the side panels and uh, also underneath here I use some supplex uh, just for the insert as well so this is a perfect way it really helps you know ventilate so if you have any areas like in the back or perhaps underneath the arms uh, or any other place that you know you, you have a lot of moisture I would definitely recommend looking into placing this kind of mesh inserts into your garments because I really really liked it and uh, another mesh that is quite common in activewear now I know that uh, I my lighting is so bright because it's super dark here in Sweden so I, I have brought up every light in the the apartment to just just be able to see my face so that means it can be a little bit difficult uh, to see the structures of the fabric it's a bit overexposed but what I'm holding in my hand now is what is often called power mesh and power mesh it's um, quite a soft mesh but it is 
has more um, stretch and firmness uh, compared to the the sports mesh that I just showed you. And this mesh I personally love to work with. It has so many uses. I use a lot for like mesh inserts on my garments, for instance, if I want to have uh, like side panels made of mesh. I really like this because it's it's very very soft to the skin, which is one of the the big advantages of using this mesh and also it's great if you want to say line a sports bra or a swimsuit this i think is the mesh that you should get because as i said it's really nice towards the skin and uh, and it ventilates really well as well but it doesn't have the sort of firm qualities that you might be looking for when you want something really to keep stuff in place so that where you probably will have to use this which is called power net now this is quite similar to the power mesh and to be honest it's used interchangeable sometimes it's called power net sometimes it's called power mesh i have myself been guilty of mixing the terms because it's really hard to know exactly some vendors call this power net as well uh, power mesh as well so it's really hard but the power net so you have to correct me if i say it wrong again here the power net is uh, firmer especially lengthwise but also you know you have to like really flex your muscles to pull it apart which makes it super great for any kind of supportive things um, if you for instance want you have a um, you're making a waistband on perhaps your leggings uh, it would probably have a tendency of uh, if the fabric is really soft you might feel that it doesn't really offer much support and it rolls and it's a bit shapeless basically so if you line it with this power net you will vastly improve the the shape of the waistband and another use is of course for bras if you're making those you can use it as a liner fabric you can use it in the back if you look if you look at a lot of um, sports bras you will see that they are using this particular fabric for a lot of the detailing and also uh, another thing that i've noticed now is that in in ready to wear have you noticed it's in a lot of leggings there has become really popular you know having you know mesh inserts you know running along the ties and i think more and more it's common it's actually power net and not the mesh that is used for this because it's of the body shaping properties that the the net has and also Christopher in the chat says that you know the the sports mesh is, is also great for lining and and it's really true it's absolutely perfect for ventilation i use it for pocket lining as well and i also use it sometimes from for the inside of a waistband when i'm doing leggings because it just transports moisturize excellent so you definitely i think you should have this in your fabric uh, stash if you're into making activewear as well and uh, and says how to tell the difference between power mesh and power net they do look the same very true and it doesn't get easier when they are mixing up the terms as well uh, when it comes to this type of fabric so i will see if i can and see where i put the power mesh okay well i'm going to start with the power net um now obviously as i said you know the lighting is uh, not as but it has um a smaller uh, let me see here if it's called in English. Um, not holds pearls basically. I mean, it's it's the mesh is um, has smaller uh, holes or uh, you have to help me now. Is it called pearls or you know the tiny tiny holes? So in in the net, those are much smaller than in the mesh, which it has a more transparent effect. So uh, if you shake the net and you pull it apart, you can see that they're very tiny tiny holes and. It has a sort of firmness that, as I said, when you pull it apart, it feels almost like a workout band. You know, when you have those uh, rehab band, when you're trying to to do rehab training and stuff, that is the feeling when you're telling it apart. But obviously you have to have it in hand to see that. But the clue obviously is that you can see that the, the holes are smaller. And for the mesh, let me see where I put that now. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, and threw it on the floor. Now, the mesh, again, obviously, you probably can't see it too much, but it has uh, bigger holes and it's much softer to the skin. And when I pull it apart, I don't really, ha I don't really get much of a workout. It's like... <laughs> uh, but when you're looking online 
And if you look at the close up page, uh, you should check that the power mesh is more transparent so you can really see through the skin. So if it's, it's a good vendor, they, they will have some kind of light over it so you can see how it, it looks. And when you compare that to the power net, um, now obviously there are different colors, but as you can see, my hand is much more covered in, in the, the net. And then again, obviously, uh, there are variations within these as well. I mean, sometimes I buy a net that is a bit more soft. And, you know, especially when you're buying online, you don't really know exactly what you're getting. And there's also another type of mesh that I didn't bring here today, which is called sometimes called Helenka mesh. And it's more it's a more matte mesh with a very soft hand that doesn't really offer any support, but it's, it's very nice and soft to the skin. And I've seen that being quite common in... Um, uh, ice skating wear and, and dance wear, the Helenka mesh. So that's another mesh as well to use. As and Greg really brings a great explanation to that. Uh, he says loose weave versus tight weave and that's very true. So that is probably the, the biggest signifier between the, the mesh and the net. But again, if when in doubt and you're ordering online, it's good to buy a sample because as I said, you never know what you're, what you're getting before you actually arrive. But sometimes we are impatient and buy anyway, which I do as well. Uh, you want to start with the product and not just having to order tons of different samples. But I, I'm always happy when I do that because it can really inform my purchases in a much better way. And uh, so that was mesh. And another type of fabric that is quite common, obviously, when you're sewing with activewear is uh, fleece. And again, there is a myriad of different type of uh, fabrics when it comes in the fleece family. The I think the most common ones is uh, what I'm holding in my hands now. It's the, the micro fleece, the soft fleece, you know, every, the sort of very soft uh, fleece that it's pretty common for baby clothes and you know any type of uh, soft applications and and those are has a use in activewear as well they can use be a, a nice form of mid layer and uh, they do transport moisture reasonably well and uh, they do keep you warm so i think that regular micro fleece is something you can definitely investigate so it's obviously really easy to find because you can probably find that in pretty much any store so you don't really need to go out and buy uh, a very high-tech polar fleece or anything like that obviously a better fleece uh, a high, more high quality fleece will be better but you can go a long way using just regular fleece in any store-bought affair that said there's a lot of discussions about this uh, as the one of the problematic things about fleece uh, which I also cover in the book uh, is that uh, it does peel a lot and uh, the plastic uh, has a very damaging effect on our waterways so it's definitely something to consider and i personally am trying to use a lot of wool rather than than fleece for my mid layer in the winter but uh, also luckily there are some recycled fleece fabrics and i also think that they are working on they're also working on developing technology where the fleece peeling stays put so it won't won't um, uh, you know, it won't sort of um, set free when you're washing it uh, and hence being damaging for the environment. So obviously fleece, it's, it's not an entire problem-free fabric for that side, but it is a very useful fabric and obviously super popular. And if you want to go a bit more um, sort of more... Um, hardcore activewear fleece you should look into the grid fleece and this is actually not something that a uh, jacket that i've made myself it's um, a swedish brand called craft and this is a typical activewear fleece in that it has grids like almost a honeycomb pattern and uh, these tiny tiny patterns actually helps transport the moisture better than regular fleece so and i know i can s some vendors do sell this type of fleece. I bought one, for instance, from America. That was really nice. And there are a lot of different versions. Some are more firm and some have more stretch. And this also, I like to think and believe that because of the structure of this fabric, it doesn't peel as much as the 
the regular microfleas that I just showed you and hopefully by definition it won't be as harmful to the environment as a regular fleas. So this is a really good product and uh, it can also have a lot of stretch and sometimes we call things like power stretch so it's it has like uh, maybe 50 to 20 percent uh, liquor in it so it's it's great if you want to you know make some kind of tight fitting uh, jacket or running leggings for instance then this kind of grid fleece is an excellent choice and also in the chat uh, regarding the the mesh discussion there i was a bit lost for word but christopher says uh, you should compare basically the, the opaqueness of the weave in 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 the images and that is very good i perceive exactly because sometimes you know a more transparent fabric is usually more soft and the power net is more opaque so thank you christopher for clarifying that and another type of fleece is let me see if i can find it here in the mess yeah another type of fleece that is obviously very useful when you're making active wear is the soft shell version which is a membrane fabric so on the outside is a, a water repellent fabric uh, and on the inside it has like a soft micro fleece oh i i really like this fabric i've done everything from ski pants to to jackets using this the nice thing is obviously that it really requires very little um, technical skills because usually if you're trying to do more warm active wear you will usually have to line it with some kind of thermo insulate fabric uh, thermo insulate lining and then of course add lining regular lining fabric on top of that so you have to do like three different uh, fabrics so it's obviously a more complicated product the advantage of using soft shell i find is that I get a lot of these things that a more complicated thermal jacket would make but with just having to use one fabric so for instance the ski pants that I used uh, was really simple to sew compared to if I would have done like a proper ski pants with um, thermal lining and inside lining and I would say that they, these work just as fine as those more complicated and it was really simple to sew uh, sometimes you can get skip stitches on um, on soft shell when you're top stitching so you, you need to figure out what needle uh, i've found that microtex needle works nicely and uh, but that can depends a little bit on the product as well i think perhaps trying a ballpoint needle instead of a regular needle could also help because it does have similar properties obviously to a knit fabric so this is a fabric that i also recommend especially for those of us in in colder climate that that needs to uh, to keep warm during the winter so soft shell is a uh, excellent fabric in that sense um, so that was just a brief if you want to have if you have any questions about any more fabrics please tell me in the chat and I will cover those as well for instance I know that some of you are really interested in working with natural fabrics which is uh, I, very understandable and something I feel really passionate about myself uh, natural fabrics with the exception of wool is usually not as well when it comes to moisturize uh, wicking away the moisturizers so for instance if you're using a cotton t-shirt uh, close to the body uh, when it gets wet it can kind of gets unpleasant but on the other hand I, it's kind of funny because uh, those of us um, you know <laughs> who are part of the older generation grew up working out in in a cotton t-shirt so obviously that worked for us and i guess now we just become more um, more demanding customers and have more expectations of the functional fabrics but obviously uh, people want marathon running in cotton t-shirts so it's obviously not necessary to have uh, synthetic wicking fabric it's just basically a comfort thing and i think if you're getting getting used to it like i am that it's so nice to have uh, the the fabric sort of removing some of the sweat from the body it, it is a very pleasant feeling so it's understandable that a lot of us are navigating more towards the synthetic fibers but obviously you know natural fibers works really nicely as well and uh, kathleen has a good point here as well that silk knit is the best for undershirts it's warm breathe and soft to the skin i couldn't agree more and 
it's really nice to transport moisture and um, one of the best fabrics that I've ever encountered in ready to wear is a mix between a silk and merino wool so it's a knit fabric that has I think 30% silk 70% wool and it's just transport moisturized fantastic well so that is obviously a very looks thing and a uh, side uh, I also just recently discovered when we were on a shopping trip uh, a gang of us local sewers here in Göteborg where I live uh, had a meetup and we went to a really nice fabric shop and in there they had silk fleece so no not it just felt it was so soft it felt just like the best synthetic fleece but it wasn't made of acrylic it wasn't made of wool it was made of silk so one of the the fellow sewers actually bought the fabric so i'm really interested to see how it works out but that would definitely be something if you want to step up your activewear game to the next level and that would be making fleece uh, silk fleece sweaters <laughs> i really like the luxury feeling of that and it was amazingly soft so i'm a bit jealous uh it just had one color which was cream white so if it had been a few more colors i would probably bought it as well so i'm really interesting to to hear our experience with that um and um Empress Nova says, do we have to adjust the patterns for account for the different degrees of stretchiness in the fabric? Absolutely. That is another key ingredient for a successful make. And when, um, so just because the fabric has the, the right amount of stretch, I mean, obviously a lot of pattern envelopes to say that this, this uh, garment should be made with a fabric that has at least 35 or 50% amount of stretch. And uh, that, is absolutely a very important measurement but for instance if you're doing your first garment with a fabric that has 50% stretch and next time you um, do your garment with a fabric that has 35% amount of stretch those two garments will not feel the same way and most likely the garment with a 35% stretch will feel a bit too snug and what I do in those instances is that I modify the pattern and that means I have to add some ease into the pattern to accommodate for the, the less amount of stretch. And it's not just stretch that all, that all can uh, alter the, the experience, it's also the thickness of the fabrics, you know. So if you're doing perhaps a, a long sleeve top, okay, for instance, uh, this... Um, this top that I talked about, uh, the fair trade surface summer top, this is obviously done in a quite soft uh, sports licra and not too thick. But if I would instead use uh, fleece for this, the thickness of the fabric is not just that fleece has less stretch, it's also thicker. So hence, it would probably squeeze my arms in a quite an uncomfortable manner. So I would probably have to go up in sizing just just to accommodate for the fact that the fabric is thicker and has less stretch. So those are the things that you probably have to be mindful. Of. And whenever it comes to those things, obviously you can do some calculations when it comes to the percentage of, um, of stretch. Uh, but what I do and in general is that I always go and look to similar gums that I have in my wardrobe with similar type of fabrics and and check the measurements hopefully when if they are fitting well so for instance if i would make um, this pattern again from fair trade using fleece i would probably pick up this stool board fleece sweater which is quite similar in design and check how the sleeves the, the width of the sleeves the width of the bodies how it sits around the tummy and then alter the pattern to make sure that it fits me nicely. So these are the things, you know, I do have learned this the hard way. And I, sometimes I cheat about it and I have to pay. In fact, I'm actually wearing a pair of leggings right now that this happened because I, I used the fabric with less stretch. So I ended up having to add mesh panels in the sides because uh, the leggings were too tight. Even though I had just recently used the exact same pattern but using a much more stretchy liquid fabric. And also, um, Kathleen has a tip if you're looking for silk, check out Dharma Trading in Seattle and they have reasonable prices. So that could be worth checking out. And um, 
And Empress Noel also asks a bit more about Softshell. Um, and Softshell is what is called a membrane fabric. So it's a mix of uh, a stretchy woven fabric that is the outer piece and soft fleece on the inside. Uh, and the outside, the the, um, the 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 woven fabric has a stretch, but I I wouldn't venture to guess how much. So it's definitely this particular soft shell is not something I would use for extremely form-fitting clothes because I can we can see here and pull it apart. So um, let's see if I can find the, the right angle here. Yeah, it doesn't have much give at all. I would say. I'm just guessing here, but just 10% cash, 10, 10 to 15%. So definitely not, it should be definitely treated as a woven when you're picking your pattern. So don't go for something crazy fitted when, when working with soft gel. Again, it can vary. I know that some, some of the windstopper fabrics, for instance, they have a bit more stretch and they're also called soft gel, but this one is more, more for, you know, stable outerwear. And, uh, and with membrane fabrics, that means basically that two different fabrics are glued together. You can find that a lot. I mean, if you look in, in a lot of fabric stores, you can find that some fabrics has lining glued to them, and that is called membrane fabrics. And also another thing that is also referred to as membrane fabric is uh, Gore-Tex fabric and, and similar water-resistant fabrics because they usually have a layer of um, coating to keep it, uh, to protect the... The regular polyester fabric from um, uh, letting in wind or water so that's that's also membrane fabric and and also i found really nice knit fabrics that also mem mem membrane fabric so it has a different uh inside than the outside and that's a beautiful thing because you can also use the the inside membrane as a detail and for instance when you're doing cuffs or or any other kind of details you can use the inside of the fabric as well so those are really interesting again not 100% probably environmentally friendly, but they're very useful fabric as they're basically two fabrics into one. And that saves a lot of time for us. So it's... And uh, Greg also asks about washing um, soft shell and it w washes really nicely, very easy, very, very easy care fabric. Uh, you do have to seal the seams in order to make it more uh, water resistant. And it's not... Um, it's not uh, water resistant, it's water repellent, I think is the correct term now. I'm, I'm trying to think on top of my head. So the water drops will uh, lay outside of the soft shell fabrics. But if you are ending up, you know, in a shower of rain, it won't resist um, all the water. But it does definitely, if you're being outside in light rain or light snow or snow for any matters, uh, the soft shell fabric will keep you dry. And um, Tom Lott, speaking of sealing seams, you can seal seams in uh, several different ways. The most common ones are um, a tape that you put on the inside of the seam. So you iron on a tape and it basically melts together. Uh, so it forms um, a waterproof uh, area around the seam. So it's basically a narrow tape that you gently have to press. The problem uh, can be that a lot of these functional fabrics are very heat resistant. So uh, when I have used some of these tapes for when I've done rain wear and things, uh, I've had to be really exact about the temperature because just a little bit too much heat will, will melt the fabric. <laughs> so that's something you have to consider. And the other common way is uh, a seam sealant, which is a lubrication, um, a fluid um, moisture, Okay, now I'm probably lost for words again, but it's a seam seal. It's basically like a glue uh, that you sort of apply along the seam area. And um, for instance, when it comes to um, waterproofing uh, soft shell, you need to use the sealant and not the tape because the tape won't stuck to the, the fleece backing, obviously, because it's just too uh, soft and mushy. So you have to use the the liquid seam sealant for that particular thing and but when you're doing classic rain wear you can go a long way with tapes and uh, I think there are better tapes than the ones I've tried so I'm definitely gonna give that another go in the future now I am um, I was at a, a sewing um, retreat 
about a year ago where um, one of my fellow students made a winter jacket, a uh, um, skiing jacket, using uh, a different kind of tape that I've tried and that looks really nice so I'm definitely gonna check that out instead. And um, so that was uh, ceiling seams and um, I also want to give like a quick overview about different kind of stitches that I use for your the different on different kind of machines. And uh, first of all, the regular sewing machine. Now, obviously, uh, you are a little bit limited when it comes to using just a regular sewing machine because especially because a sewing machine lacks the differential feed of a cover stitch or a serger and the differential feed is what will keep the fabric in check so you can regulate the feed and and thus um, uh, being being able to adjust how much the the seam is stretched out or kept together and one of the problems that you might encounter especially when you're sewing a lot of stretch knit that isn't um, very stable is that on a sewing machine it has a tendency of sometimes stretching out especially when you when you're hemming those kind of fabrics and that is the main drawback with using a sewing machine however there are a lot of ways to mitigate uh, to solve this problem and I, I talk a lot about that in the book you know tips for how to be successful just using a sewing machine and when I'm, I'm sewing knits on a sewing machine I rely on a couple of different stitches and uh, one of the I would venture to say that most modern sewing machine has at least one or several kind of stretch seams and those stretch seams are usually the trademark is that they go back and forth so they they don't stitch, they go back, they go forth. So it does um, create a really, a really secure and also very stretchy seam because of the back and frontwards movement. So, and they sometimes do, they do require a special presser foot, but at least on my sewing machines that I've owned over the years, those have been included. So if you're a bit unsure about, check the manual and see if you have a stretch stitch. And they usually are, have some kind of, uh, shape they can actually look quite similar to an overlock seam on a serger so that is usually a clue as well but it should be described in the manual i think and another way if you don't have one of those stretch seams or just want to have more control because one of the big disadvantages of using a stretch seam on a sewing machine is that uh, because they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and they create a really secure seam that won't rip. It also means it creates a, a seam that is absolutely awful to rip. <laughs> so you definitely need to think ahead before you venture into that. You can't do that and just realize that, ah, I need to do something a little bit different. That didn't work out. So you, you definitely need to have all your ducks in a row when you're doing using the sewing machine stretch seams and but there is an option and it's sometimes it's called lightning bolt stitch and it sometimes it's called two rows of zigzag stitch so you you basically first sew uh in a row using a narrow zigzag and narrow is obviously um, doesn't have as sharp corners so it's it's a little bit like this and then the second row the outer row you so a regular medium size zigzag stitch and that is actually really durable and it's obviously much easier to control when you're sewing compared to the sewing machine stretch stitch and uh, another thing uh, another theme about from the sewing machine is obviously when you're hemming and you can either use a zigzag stitch uh, if you like that look but if you're going for say a more professional finish I would definitely recommend that you instead use a twin needle or it's sometimes called a double needle uh, which basically requires two spools of, of threads in the upper and then one thread in the bobbin and that mimics the cover stitch uh, and it's it's really nice it creates 6x6 underneath and I think it works quite well just remember to to get one of those ballpoint twin needles and not a regular twin needle because otherwise you probably end up with skip stitches and you might also need to stabilize the fabric, perhaps using a tearaway stabilizer or wonder tape, which is a sticky tape that is water soluble, because um, sometimes the uh, double stitch has a tendency of uh, creating ridges, so it's, it's like a bubble in the middle, and also um, 
you can also have problems with it stretching out too much uh, on some fabric so that is one of one of the reasons that you sometimes need to use a stabilizer but it also comes down to practice i think that if you learn to how to manipulate the fabric and not stretching it out when you're sewing on a sewing machine but try to keep it in check with your hands if you know what i mean that really helps as well And uh, Kathleen also has another great idea about the, the, the problem of uh, trying to uh, rip <laughs> a very secure stitch. And uh, it's also based first because that gives you a lot more control as well. Uh, when you're basting knits, I wouldn't recommend that you use um, small stitches because they can be quite firm. You want to, to have a certain um, ease and suppleness of um, basting when you're sewing with it so i like to use quite loose and large stitches because they they don't really interfere with the, the stability of the fabric so that's that's recommendation of of uh when you're basting knits that don't don't pull it and tug because that will usually mess up the end result so just loose stitches it will just keep things in shape that is the best way i think and uh, that was sewing machine I, I would love to know if you um if you all guys have surgeries and cover stitch machine please tell me in the chat because so we can cover that as well uh, when it comes to surgery the most common stitch i think for um, sewing stretching it is either the three thread overlock or the four thread overlock and the three thread overlock uses one needle and two two threads in the lupus and the four thread uses two needles and two threads in the lupus and the biggest advantage of using a three thread overlock which you can both sew wide or narrow is that it has more stretch compared to the the four thread overlock which obviously though it does feel very secure it's also quite firm when you pull it like when you pull it out so i would say if you want to go with four thread, you would probably use it more for more stable things like fleece sweaters. Uh, and when you're doing stretchy garments, I would definitely primarily use the three thread overlock. That's my experience as well. Also, on some some sewing machines that has some surgeries that has um, there are either combination machines that can are both a surgery and a cover stitch machine. They actually have. Um, something that is called uh, super stretch seams or uh, stretch uh, stretch overlock and that is different because it has two needle threads but one looper and i used to have that on my old uh faff machine which, which was a combination of uh, a surgery and a cover stitch machine so that is if you have that that can also be an option i really liked it because it was very it felt super secure and also really stretchy because it used two needles uh but I, I took a surgery course recently because I switched to um, baby lock last year and I took a surgery course for that quite recently and I asked the teacher about that if uh, what she thought and uh, if the the old the, 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 the stretch uh, stitch that I had on my own old faff machine was uh, better than the the three thread overlock and she said she didn't think that the the old one that I had was any better so that perhaps was just my mental thing that I, I felt it felt more secure using two needles but she was like ah it's unnecessary <laughs> and I trust her she she knows what jokes about and um and Tom a lot asked what type of baby lock surgery do you have and I have imagine it cost about a million bucks it was super expensive at least uh, compared to my previous uh, surgery and what a regular surgery i will say though that i love it it produced fantastic stitching and it has auto tension so i use and it despite the fact that it's i can't really um adjust the tensions it delivers excellent seams on pretty much anything i have there have been some instances where i really wish that it had tension settings especially when i'm i'm sewing flat lock seams because that's usually means you have to alter tension there are a screw where you can alter the tensions but then you alter tension on everything and not just one particular thread disc so that's a that's a disadvantage but apart from that it's a wonderful machine and from what i tell from people i know everyone who has a baby lock says it's way better than other surgery so i feel confident in saying that it is a fantastic machine but 
it costs about three, two to three times more than a regular domestic surgery, at least here in Sweden. So that was my biggest ever sewing investment because I've I've always used used machines and and quite cheap machines, but but this time I felt I, after over 30 years of, of sewing, I, I felt ready to invest in myself and in my, uh, in my sewing machines. And I think that is the, uh, imagine is perhaps, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the upper level of baby lock surgeries. And the, the, there are also, baby lock also have a combinations machine and it's called evolution, right? Uh, please correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, which is even more expensive. It's like twice or three times as much. And but apparently it's a fantastic machine. So that is perhaps ovation, baby lock ovation, I think it's called. Uh, so if you have a lot of money to spare and want to have a cover stitch machine and a surgery in the same machine, that is probably one of the best things you can buy. And uh, uh, yeah, as I should mention, um, as I said, I talked about flat lock seams and I do, when you're looking in stores on most stretchy activewear, you will see that they have a flat seam. Uh, so there is no seam allowance on the inside and it looks very similar on the outside and the inside. And then you go home and you look at your sewing machines and you realize that there is no way that I can create the exact same seam on my domestic machine because that is the ones that you're seeing in stores, which is probably the most popular way these days to assemble activewear. That is an industrial flat lock machine. And as of today, at least, it's not available uh, something similar on the domestic market. So, but surgeons can always do flat lock seams and they call surgery flat lock seams and the most common ones are two thread and three thread and uh, the two thread is quite easy to sew to, to get it to lie flat and the three thread is a little bit more difficult but you can be successful with that as well so if you look at this navy seam that goes crosswise on the fair trade top this one is done with the three thread flat lock and i've used a uh, woolly nylon which is a fluffy thread and it covers really nicely and uh, with a little bit of a fiddling and uh, I managed to, to create a really nice um, result I think with this one. Now, when you look inside, I hope you can see this, it doesn't look anything like uh, the industrial flat lock because it just have this uh, kind of ladder, uh, straight lines like this. And you can also use this on the outside if that's something you prefer. It's just a matter of taste, but it does work similar to an industrial flat lock seam. And I wouldn't say though that it's um, uh, it's not as sturdy as the industrial flat lock. So you have to be mindful of that and not expect the exact same result when it comes to um, to the, um, the 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 industrial flat lock. But it's it's uh, definitely worth checking out. And you know. I've done it. I talk a lot about it, how to succeed with the flat lock seams in the book. And I've also done on my blog a tutorial on how to succeed with the three thread flat lock, uh, talking a lot about what you need when it comes to tension and things like that to sort of manage um, to get that sort of nice flat flat lock seam. And there is also. Um, uh, Kathleen also said that she found flat lock is nice with fleece. Yes, absolutely. And you will get excellent result using the two thread uh, flat lock stitch on fleece. And if you also, if you want to get the sort of ready to wear finish, you can use like contrasting thread using woolly nylon because those are really fluffy and are quite common in ready to wear. So that you can create, you know, nice decorative effects with the contrasting thread. So I, I really recommend if you haven't, if you have a surger and you haven't really uh, dived into the flat lock area of the machine, it's definitely worth trying out and see. You can also use it for hemming uh, if you don't have a, a cover stitch machine. Uh, I talk about that method as well in the book. So it's a really nice way to um, to create a really stretchy seam without having a, a, a cover stitch machine. And not 
Atkinson has uh, has an ovation, lucky you nod, uh, and says it's a wonderful invest- investment and it's wonderful. My results are so much professional and I recommend it highly. And Nod has been suing for over 40 years, so that is uh, a very high um Hi, it's very holding very high regard. Thank you for your input there. It's definitely one of a dream machines. And also, uh, when it comes to um, Covestis machine, there's also now um, Brother has one machine, and uh, there could be other ones coming as well that do um, reverse uh, cover stitching on both sides. And so the um, um, the chain thread is similar both on the outside so in a regular cover stitch machine it's just straight stitches on the outside and then on the inside you'll you'll have the um, the chain pattern and that chain pattern looks very similar to a flat lock seam and uh, brother now has a machine that that sews identical um, chain stitches on both sides and i i saw an example of this in real life a couple of weeks ago uh in a local sewing shop here and it looks incredible uh so that is another dream machine <laughs> it is a bummer now that i've finally upgraded and i realize now that there are so many better machines out there but you know all in good time <laughs> and uh f Shedden says would you recommend using suplex rather than a li- liquor from workout legacy now suplex uh that contains Lycra or LSD or Spandex. It's basically the same fabric, but it, it, it's different brand names and it's also used in different parts of the world. Uh, so Suplex is a mix of polyester and uh, and Lycra. However, I would definitely say that um, if you're referring to traditional Lycra, such as swimsuit fabrics and other type of polyester, I would definitely much prefer that, that one use Suplex because it it wicks away its moisture but much better and just feels more like proper workout clothes. Uh, I know that some people do um, actively in swimsuits fabrics, but I'm a little bit skeptical myself and I don't really like the hand of that fabric. But I know obviously some really like it, so uh, who am I to say? <laughs> and uh, also Janet has some kind words for my book. Uh, she, she says, Janet's book is a great investment even for a novice like me. Close up pictures of the details are excellent too. I'm really pleased I invested. And uh, Kathleen also said, I love Janet's book. Thank you so much. That means so much to hear. And uh, that that's all I hope, you know. I, I just want, you know, to share the stuff that I learned and help others also improve their sewing. So I'm, I'm definitely part of the journey myself. I'm also learning stuff all the time. I'm, I'm not out there, you know, putting myself and saying I'm an expert. I just want to pass along the things that I've learned myself and and it's also a process, you know, and, and keep learning things. So a lot of the book is also focused on how you can achieve professional results, even if you just have your own regular domestic sewing machine. And also if you're not um, advanced or intermediate, even if you're just a beginner, it's just, you know, a lot of things isn't usually covered in, in uh, sewing books when it comes to sewing with knits, especially. Uh, so those are the things that I, I talk a lot about. And it's usually a small things that is so good to know that makes a huge difference. And and that is one of the f- reasons why I wrote this book, because I really want to to help, you know, share those kind of tips that people have taught me along the way and things that I've learned myself the hard way, just, you know, to minimize all those heartache that comes from not exactly knowing how to proper properly use these kind of fabrics for a really nice result. So... And uh, Greg says also, I love that you always share your knowledge. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy that you you came to me and, and the chat and asked the, a lot of excellent questions as well. And, and time has flown by now. And I could probably talk for this <laughs> for many hours more, but I, I can do another live stream about this topic perhaps later on because I have a lot more cover things that I wasn't able to to uh, cover for it. And um and also some really wise words here that that the lear- the learning curve is basically forever because it doesn't really matter how long we'll be sewing, we always learn new things. And that is one of the wonderful things also I think about the online sewing community is that we all help each other and you know, we just just helps us all expanding our, our sewing knowledge. For instance, when I began sewing with knits in the eighties, I made so many mistakes because there were no sources that talked about how 
to properly handle knit fabrics, especially if you only had a sewing machine. And the same thing was when I, when I first bought my serger. Again, there were some books out there, but uh, they weren't, you know, a lot of the things I've actually learned from other people who are doing it and, and doing my own experimentation. And that hadn't been possible without this sewing community. So I think that I, I've been part of it from 2003, I think I, I registered over a pattern review. And, and since then I've been pretty active in the, in the online sewing community. And if I compare these 15 years of my learning curve to the almost 20 years before that, I have so much improved my skills in a way that wasn't possible. I mean, the first 20 years, I, I just made very small um, developments in my skills. And now for the last 15 years, it just has expanded because there's so much collective knowledge. And that's why I also really feel passionate about sharing the things that I've learned. So because sewing can be quite hard if you if you have no one to to show you how to do things so that's something i'm very very passionate about spreading those things along and uh well it's it's one hour now so i'm very very thank you for everyone who turned out and thank you for keeping the chat going and i really look forward to i will definitely try to do a live chat once a month as i did before the the holidays so i am uh, doing another one in February so stay tuned for that I will post some more details when I I have planned that and what topic I will talk about and well thank you so much and uh, you for being so wonderful and uh, staying here with me for an hour and I'll see you next time bye bye <laughs>